so, and before I start, I would like to allow myself the liberty of um, telling two little tales or anecdotes. The first one is, um, comes from a visit I had from my former professor in the Academy of Arts in Copenhagen, who came here several years ago. And um, we were driving around the country, like you do when you have foreign visitors, of course. And as we sat in the car rack that he had rented, he said, oh dear, once again there's a group of students who have found some Soviet silos or some building in Estonia and they want to make something out of it as their, you know, term project and oh, I can't have any more of those, you know, artist residencies with coffee houses and movie theaters in some outskirts. And I was trying to be sort of, you know, open-minded and yeah, okay, this is material and we have to use it and uh, and then all of a sudden I had this sort of deep, sort of all-encompassing lack of compassion and actually just irritation. And the poor guy, I probably yelled at him. I think I actually hit the brakes in the middle of the road from Gullverjabær and said, enough already. I mean, come on. Why is it that I am supposed to spend my life's work answering questions that I probably would have deemed rotten to begin with? Why am I always reacting to things that I didn't believe in in the first place? What does Soviet silo mean to me today? And afterwards I felt a little bit bad because of course, again, this is material that exists and, and we have to take some kind of a, a stance towards it. But seriously, how, how can we apply our sort of basic personal ideologies within context that we sometimes don't understand the logic of? The second little story comes from last week, because this story popped in my head, up in my head again, when I met my old student, one of my good old students, who just finished her studies in the um, sustainable, or the Department of Sustainability in the School of Architecture in Delft in Holland. And she um, was telling me that she had made this um, hospital for uh, people who had had some kind of uh, brain hemorrhage. And the jurors were discussing to which extent her project reflected her notion of sustainability or knowledge of sustainability. And the main juror uh, says, well, actually, it doesn't really matter how much you have thought about BIMS or BRAMS or whatever you call the, the different types of sustainable Excel sheet systems, your building is culturally sustainable. It is beautifully and very intuitively um, carved around people. And no matter what the function will be in the future for the people using this building, it is culturally sustainable and thus will probably want to stand on its own. Now, in a sense, this is stating the obvious, that uh, buildings, if they are good, they should be sensible, they should make sense. But somehow that doesn't necessarily apply to all buildings, like we know. So, um, we, in a sense, in the... Um, in this sort of first regeneration of our, um, of our little, well, you can call it town if you want. I think it's more of a metro village with suburbs. Um, we have the, the luck of having quite a lot of our um, modernistic buildings made in a sensible way, simply because we didn't have that much resources to experiment apart from what was needed, especially when the, um, this little society of ours was growing up. 
And um, one of the projects that um, I personally have um, participated in that addresses this is the, um, the renewal of the um, headquarters of Íslandsbanki back in 2005, where I worked with uh, Architectu Pontris, Einrum, and Andres Nair Magnusson. And as we um, interrogated the site, we had the opportunity to demolish the old building and build a new one, uh, which most of the other uh, proposals did. But when thinking about this beautiful house that we felt had great cultural value, Kirkjukoll, which actually some of us actually had worked in as teenagers, uh, working with fish, this was an old sort of fish factory, um, we thought it was a great shame to lose this cultural heritage. We felt that the, the house was beautiful as it was, if we sort of imagined the aluminum sheets uh, disappearing. And we could also see how the dried fish could be replaced by cars, actually under, under grass, but how we could sort of, you know, begin to see similar, um, both social and, and, and activities, in a sense, um, where exactly, for example, in the halls where the women would weigh the, the fish in the old days, you would have very similar settings of uh, stockbroking dealers uh, sitting around computers. You just replace the weights with, with computers, and, but, but in a sense you have the same kind of a, a, a function, which we felt was um, interesting to, to experiment with. Now, um, like I touched upon before, we, we, as a community, we gain our sovereignty as a as a state in 1918, and we are in this big rush to become uh, a nation among nations, and before we even realize that maybe we should ask ourselves the question, what do you want to be as a society, we have sort of um, cemented it in the answer that we still are working out from, actually in a ring road that exploded pretty soon. Um, and what has to be considered is that at the same time as the big modernist movement is sort of growing from the industrial age and the new sort of social ideas of what an individual is in the society, we are here. And I know actually Halter said in some interview that he probably would have thought that um, Gisli Halterson and uh, Sigvaldi would probably not have thought of the turf house as their sort of ideal field, that the modernistic sort of answer was their sort of vision of, of, of becoming a, a, a new society. But there is a structure. If we would imagine that we poured down some coloring agents into the social structure that came out of this, um, we would see, I think, a very important cultural sustainable structure that we might have neglected in the context of the um, uh, modernistic sort of rise of our city, namely the fact that in the old days, as we lived in the turf houses, we were so few and scarcely sort of distributed over the country that we did of course not have any road systems we didn't have any systems of inns or hostels or anything, so um, except for in the biggest villages. So in a sense, we developed a very um, fine but strong um, social structure that still lives within us. So the front of the turf house was, in a sense, the village square. And the most intimate place of the turf house, your bed, was the hotel. And if you wanted to be um, able to move freely across the country, you would have to be able to, uh, willing to invite perfect strangers to come into your most private um, property. Now, this, in a sense, becomes interesting 
when you look at the um, society, for example, of Reykjavik today, um, I have the pleasure of teaching at the Academy of the Arts, like I was introduced before, and have, for example, the pleasure of teaching the beautiful bunch of people sitting here in the corner. Um, the, um, some years ago, we asked our students to make a survey of the homes that they lived in and the nearest generations around them, their fathers and mothers, grandparents, sisters, and if they had the child who lived at another place as well, to, to sort of map the homes, who lived there, how it was, and we asked them to also take notice if there was anyone outside the home or the family who had to have a regular sort of residence within that frame. Now, what didn't surprise us, of course, the families were quite variable. What didn't surprise us was the fact that the generation of their parents lived two people in houses of 200 to 300 square meters, mostly to be able to uh, accommodate for their children's um, need for flexible living. So either the children were living abroad and coming home for holidays or vacations, they were getting divorced, they were buying houses. So if you will, the, the generation of the parents were almost held hostages within these huge frames to be able to accommodate for this familial flexibility. What surprised us was the fact that the majority of homes, including the homes of the students themselves, also had people living regularly within their sort of boundaries and that they had to be able to accommodate for that life. And I'm not talking about, you know, having my uh, brother's uh, children staying over because I was babysitting, but actually something that you really had to sort of think of. And that's quite interesting when you consider that the second generation of our residential sort of design and building in Reykjavik has absolutely uh, designed out everything that resembles a guest room or flexible um, sort of spaces. Back in the old days, though, when we were building Reykjavik, usually you would have this extra room. You would have either the husband's room, the, the den, or you would have the uh, maid's room, or some kind of a, a, a sort of extra space uh, for these purposes. And even the most sort of restricted um, housing, like you, we have, for example, in, in uh, around Trinkbrød, you would usually have a little space in the basement or at the attic where you could accommodate for the family coming from, from the country. So, um, so for me, I think when we um, consider this legacy and consider how much, in a sense, modernism uh, actually took the cultural values or the cultural structures into account, I think we should um, maybe use that as an as a, as a ideological sort of lead. Because come to think of it, we tend to, we were talking about the city planning this morning, and we tend to make glossy images of new suburbs with, you know, uh, beautiful houses and lots of life, uh, life between them. People, you know, cycling about, playing about, talking to each other, drinking coffee. But the reality is that we cannot populate one single street in Reykjavik as it is, except for Laugavur, and that's mostly due to the tourists. So if we want to make a sustainable and um, livable urban sort of field for ourselves, we probably have to think in other ways. And um, one of the things that we have also asked our students to, to research is all kind of demographic sort of uh, information about Reykjavik. This, for example, is a map of the distribution of elementary schools. So one of the gifts that the modernism gave to us is the fact that every neighborhood has a school, an elementary school, situated in such a fashion that every six-year-old child has the ability to walk to school in, let's say, five or ten minutes. Now, 
as you can see, that almost this, this walking distance almost covers the whole sort of urban area of Reykjavik, be it scarce or disease. And the question is, instead of thinking in terms of streets and filling the, the streets with life in our climate and in our sort of social distributed settings, another way of thinking of, of densifying a city could be, like one of our student groups proposed, think of the schools. I mean, some of these schools are 60 or 70 years old, so even the old people in the quarters have used the school and have memories of using the school. The schools are usually designed in a way that you have smaller living areas, uh, classroom areas where you can sort of sit as a group. They have big, nice uh, sort of uh, halls to, to have accommodate for elderly people dancing or babies yoga on, on weekends. But instead, we spent an incredible amount of time. Actually, the same student group found out that we spent an average of half an hour per habitant in Reykjavik, in car, and mostly alone. So 90,000 hours a day are spent in a car in Reykjavik alone, which is sort of like the downside of the modernist planning um, for us today. Now, this sort of re-thinking um, or re-looking into the, this heritage of, of modernist, especially social building, has been a big thing especially in Sweden, you know, amongst our, our, our um, neighbors. Sweden, of course, built an enormous amount of social housing during the, the modernist era and are now in both in theory and in practice trying to um, consider what can we do with this. Um, especially when we are having people from other places with other backgrounds and other cultural sort of structures coming and using these places. These spaces are usually designed for a nuclear family of mom, dad, and two kids, which is not necessarily the reality of the majority, for example, of people in cities now living alone, or uh, coming from, like I said, other backgrounds where people usually live together, you know, across families or generations. Um, what I wanted to sort of and here, as a, as a little sort of opening up for us, is um, the work of Lagaton and Vassal, an uh, architectural practice that is situated in Paris, as this, and also internationally. Um, this is their first project from 93, where they draw from um, Vassal's, he's, he's born in Morocco, and spent a year in Niger. And um, had to work on what he doesn't want to call urban planning, but village planning. And with the sort of nomadic um, context of, of, of many gener generations living together, very sort of challenging uh, climate, even though it's maybe challenging in a different way than we have. And um, using this sort of um, idea of minimal uh, materials, but maximizing flexibilities, thresholds, and openness for the development of social structures within the building, they designed the single family house, which is just a very sort of um, modest wooden box um, covered with what we could almost say a greenhouse from our standards, but also mixed up with all kinds of um, drapery and, and possibilities to open up and, and close, as we see. So they can actually make a microclimate uh, within the building. And they actually sort of thought that the people uh, who commissioned the, the house would fill the, the, um, the sort of outer space with, with flowers, just like you, know, you would in a greenhouse. But what surprised them was that the people actually moved their living room out there and have lived there more or less ever since, in this very sort of flexible, uh, opening, closing, uh, considering uh, or, or sort of responding to the, both the environment, but also just the mood that they're in. I mean, do we want to open up for our neighbors now or not? Um, they then took this idea further, where they were asked to, along with five other um, agencies, uh, Sigrid Ban, uh, Chanel and more, to 
design a, a housing sort of um, complex in Mulhouse. And what they wanted to do there, because they knew that the people living there would be of different sort of family sizes, and, and they knew that, for example, immigrants would be using these um, facilities, they proposed to the um, commissioner of the municipality to um, get the permission to make the houses uh, double, I think, half or double, the size that was in the pretext, uh, if they promised to keep the um, budget uh, as it had been in the brief originally. So they designed this sort of base of um, concrete that is, again, covered with some kind of a greenhouse-ish um, cover and with a huge um, emphasis on this flexibility of thresholds. And, and from that, they get this sort of um, multitude of inside-outside spaces that actually work that well. They, they, they have actually just continued to develop this idea further, which comes to my major point here in the, concerning the um, um, legacy of the modernism. Around the year 2000, the French government uh, had decided to demol uh, demolish 200,000 apartments in old modernistic social housing. Now, for Lagoton and Vassal, this would mean a humongous waste of energy and resources that they found very sad. And, um, worked up a plan that they have since developed and, and done in more places, where instead of demolishing a house and building a new one, they add half a house with a very sort of um, refined structure, aluminum structure, that sort of looks like a, a balcony, but is more complicated since they also start to um, take down the outer walls and some of the inner walls, um, arguing that with the deepening of the flat itself, the distance within it becomes a partition in itself. And uh, also celebrating, and that's a big point for them, that the life in these buildings, so they, when they were doing research, they went to see how these people lived in these old buildings. And what they found out, that even in the most challenged social um, quarters, there was an enormous, um, nuanced richness and um, variables between all these different flats that people had actually sort of inhabited the space in, in their extremely varied ways. And for them, that was also a social value that they didn't want to miss. So um, by taking up some of the, um, the inner walls and, and the old outer walls and putting on this sort of like I said, it's not simply a balcony, but it becomes like a, a two- or threefold threshold so that then opens up in a multitude of ways that both secures the more intimate private spaces that are needed for every individual, but opens up for a great flexibility for the inhabitants according to, you know, the number of family members or, or um, the function of, of, of the particular family to play with, with and they take... Uh, elements like curtains, flowers, and um, furniture extremely seriously in this uh, scenography. So what you have is a relatively simple intervention that costs, I mean, not even half of what it would have cost to demolish the house alone, let alone build a new one, and gain a new, culturally sustainable and nuanced way to both use the um, structure of the houses, the resources, the material, instead of throwing them away, but at the same time, um, developing this, this nuanced and uh, multiple way of living together. Um, and this is also one of the modernistic houses where the Academy of the Arts lives today. 
Um, I think I'm coming a little bit over time, but uh, um, I still want to use the opportunity while I stand here to end this with a little question to um, you, or us, the architects. We had the head of the planning committee of Reykjavik here before, um, discussing and describing the architect in a somewhat, uh, let's say, challenging way. And I'm, I'm wondering whether we as a profession um, regard ourselves able or responsible for the cultural sustainability of the buildings or the plannings that we make. Do you feel adept to take the responsibility given to you by, for example, the head of the planning committee before, describing us as the sort of people who want to decide everything down to the latest or, or the minor detail, stopping people from developing their own lives or their own um, uh, environment, or even, as it described, as um, costume makers of old building. Um, these are very uh, big sort of suggestions to make of a whole profession. And um, I think it's actually quite important that we consider where we stand as a profession today in that, in that context. Thank you.